And for people who are trying to decide about Christ and about whether or not God is worth it, they don't see just one church. They see the church as a whole. So when one church um, doesn't engage in the community, they see all churches that way. So what I'm learning is when churches can come together and when we can demonstrate care and concern for the communities we serve, we, we shift the narrative for the whole church, not just our church brand. And I think that's why church collaboration is so important today. We're not just one church. We are the church of Charlotte, the church of Kansas City. We're the church of that particular city. And people are looking to us to see, are we only caring about ourselves or are we caring about really the things that God cares about? Well, thank you for watching another episode of the Jew3 Project podcast. As always, I'm your host, Lisa Fields, the founder of the Jew3 Project. And today I'm joined by a very special guest, um, Dr. Nicole Massey Martin. Welcome, Dr. Martin. Thank you. I'm so excited. <laughs> I'm so excited to have you. Uh, I found out about your work a few years ago. And so I'm glad to finally have you on the podcast. For those who don't know who you are, can you just give them a little background? Sure. Um, I'm Nicole Martin. I am currently serving as a senior mobilizer with American Bible Society. I'm also a professor at Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary, where I am the assistant professor of ministry and leadership development. I'm a graduate of Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary with my doctorate of Princeton Theological Seminary with my MDiv and Vanderbilt University with my undergrad. I live in Charlotte. I'm from Baltimore. I like food. I'm a mommy. I have a three-year-old and a five-year-old, an amazing husband. And I love Jesus. Is that enough? <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's awesome. That's awesome. You wear many hats. Um, I've been interested. I see that you're working with the American Bible Society. What does that? What is kind of your work with that? Man, I have such a blessed um, calling with American Bible Society, where I get to work with churches throughout the city and mobilizers in other cities to literally see people's lives transformed by engaging in Scripture. So for, you know, American Bible Society has been around for more than 200 years. And we started out with just distribution and some translation work. And now we're getting more into transformation work. So once someone has a Bible, will they actually read it? And what happens when people read the Bible? So I get to come alongside churches and networks, um, church organizations to encourage scripture engagement in a variety of ways. That's awesome, because I believe that biblical literacy is one of the key to uh, apologetic work. If you don't know the Bible, you can't defend it. Um, yep. so that's really critical. Um, something else I've been um, watching and work you're doing is uh, you're working with Movement Day. Um, tell um, our audience a little bit about that. Yeah. So Movement Day is really a, um, a series of, of gatherings and catalytic events that started out of New York. It's um, really driven by Dr. Mac Peer and his team out of the Leadership um, Center in New York. But Movement Day came to Charlotte really out of, I believe, an outpouring of a series of, of of trying to get the church to unite in different ways. So um, it, depending on who you ask, Movement Day started way before the actual day. We've had a number of prayer movements in our city. Um, Billy Graham Evangelical Association has started prayer movements. We've got um, churches that have been trying to get together in a number of ways. Um, but Movement Day came in uh, this year, I think at just the right time. We had more than 200 different churches um, represented. We had more than 900 attendees, a wait list of 300 people, all leaders, all marketplace leaders and church leaders trying to impact our city for good. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. And I think that is phenomenal because our collaboration, I think, is one of the ways that we impact the culture and our cities for transformation. Why do you think uh, it's so important for our cities today, the to churches to collaborate? Yeah, well, I, I realized, I used to uh, work in church ministry for about 12 years. And when I was on staff, I really did believe that my church was responsible for our church brand, that what we did and who we were in the community was all about our church. But when I began working collaboratively among churches, I realized there's a narrative within the church that just carries your church name, but then there's a narrative outside of the church. 
And for people who are trying to decide about Christ and about whether or not God is worth it, they don't see just one church. They see the church as a whole. So when one church um, doesn't engage in the community, they see all churches that way. So what I'm learning is when churches can come together and when we can demonstrate care and concern for the communities we serve, we, we shift the narrative for the whole church, not just our church brand. And I think that's why church collaboration is so important today. We're not just one church. We are the church of Charlotte, the church of Kansas City. We're the church of that particular city. And people are looking to us to see, are we only caring about ourselves or are we caring about really the things that God cares about? Mm -hmm. And that's yeah. such an important note because when we do our, our HBCU here and we're talking to students on, on campuses, yes. when they talk about their bad experience at church, it is the whole church that becomes <laughs> the problem for them. And so you saying that, I think, clarifies it. Um, me and others you know that we represent each other as we go out. Exactly right. Exactly and so right. we often think in tribal terms, but if we don't understand the importance of the togetherness, we'll, we'll um, hurt ourselves in that. Have you seen that? Absolutely. You know, we had um, a panel of city leaders and they included representatives from the school system from uh, we had our chief of police, um, Chief Kerr Putney, and we had um, the executive director of the YMCA and others. And when the question was asked, what can the church do to support your leadership of the city? I believe it was Chief Putney that said what the church can do to help the police is to collaborate and not compete. Mm. And it on me that the whole city benefits when churches come together. The whole city, schools benefit, sp uh, police systems benefit, our young people benefit when the church can come together. And it is not easy. And there are 101 obstacles. And you might, you know, collaborate on one area and fail in another, but how often will we get back up and try the collaboration again? Mm -hmm. One of the things that hinders people from collaborating is doctrinal divides. Um, how do we um, overcome those in collaboration? Yeah, yeah, that, that becomes um, very tricky. I've noticed even in a city like Charlotte, it's doctrinal and sometimes it's political as well. Um, and so f part of my work, for example, with American Bible Society is finding partners who are willing to um, at least even for a particular issue, put aside certain things that might be divisive for the sake of what unites us. So, for example, we're working on a project on um, shifting the degree of scripture engagement through racial trust. How can we help people to see that the Bible is a way where you can convene and, and really um, bridge some gaps racially? And we found that in order to even come to the table to start the conversation, there are some things people have to check at the door. Um, there are some political views that they have to check at the door. There's some, for some people, some guilt and for others, some anger that doesn't need to be dismissed, but how can I um, be willing to suspend that for a moment for the sake of what's good? And this is where the, the challenge comes in because there are times when my view is strong enough that it needs to be brought out and it needs to be discussed and maybe we'll see some change there. And then there are other times where you know certain things are divisive. When, when we first started the Movement Day conversation, um, there were leaders that came to the table and said, we must have this issue addressed year one. And it was tough. It was really tough to say, we know and we believe that this is good, but because it is potentially divisive, we can't talk about that year one. And I know that we had people that walked away and said, you know, if you're not going to deal with my issue, I'm not in it at all. And that's the cost. I mean, unity work always comes with a cost. Mm -hmm. That's, that's uh, quotable right there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> For those who did um, push past the, uh, Doc, the doctrinal issues. Did you have any testimonials that said, man, this was really helpful. I'm glad that I didn't allow what divided us to hinder us working together. Oh my goodness, yes. 
So I, I led the track on affordable housing. And um, I had a panel on the affordable housing, you know, th four, three individuals that are very committed in different ways. One speaker had a passion for homelessness. The other speaker was a historian and prophet and really spoke about where we've been and where we need to go. The other one was a woman in her 20s who uh, got tired of hearing about it and decided to buy a couple of houses with her and her friends. So we're having this discussion and one of the women stood up um, in, the congre in the congregation, but in the, in the workshop and gave a comment and she said, um, I am formerly incarcerated and I wanna know what are we gonna do to help those who are formerly incarcerated? One of the panelists, uh, the young woman panelists said, oh my gosh, um, are you Mona? And the woman said, yes. Yeah. She said, we have been looking for you. We have been praying for you and we wanna help you. And it was right uh -huh. there in the workshop. But here's the thing, about two weeks after that workshop, this woman, um, I think it was Ramona, not Mona, Ramona passed away. And I was watching the news and I heard about Mo, uh, Ramona passing away. And immediately I began thanking God for this space of convening where Ramona's name could be heard, where her comments could be heard, where someone from the panel could validate her work, where people could crowd around her after that gathering and say, thank you for the work that you're doing to help the formerly incarcerated. I mean, while my heart is broken that she's not with us, her work got a platform at Movement Day that she wouldn't have had and, and God appointed that because, I mean, she's not here with us right now. So that's just one story, just one story that stood out to me of why timing is everything, why God is good and, you know, working through those testimonies. That's know. awesome. Um, yeah. what, what kind of topics did you, um, you all address year one um, for oh. Movement Day? Yeah. So year one from the stage, we addressed racial reconciliation. We actually had um, Brian Carter and Jeff Warren from Dallas come and speak about their pulpit exchange. And then we backed that up with two pastors locally who are doing work together with racial reconciliation. We talked about um, issues facing our city um, with the leaders panel that I discussed. Um, we talked about um, the importance of prayer. We had a time of prayer um, for leaders and for each other. Um, um, year one, we talked also about education. We had um, Pamela Davies come, and she's the president of one of our local universities. And then we had breakout groups, and our breakout tracks were broad. They both focused on the city and on the church. So we had a multiplication track that focused on growth and the church. We had a pastor's track where they talked about a possible sermon series. We had an affordable housing track, which is the one that I led. We had a mobility track, which focused on literacy for young people. Um, we even had a multicultural track for churches that are looking at how we become more multicultural. And we had a marketplace track for those who are Christians working in the marketplace. Now, for me, this is one of the best parts of Movement Day because we do a lot of church conferences but this convening focused on the church and marketplace and the value of business leaders and why a pastor needs to listen to a marketplace leader. So that, that I mean, that's just an overview of some of the things we offered. Yeah, that's great. I, I love the uh, market marketplace emphasis because okay. for so many leaders who are in full-time ministry, yes. they're disconnected from the regular world. I was sitting on a panel for men and women engagement in the church and um, you know, that the, there's, you know, in, in monks, some conservative evangelical spaces, they really hold true to the Billy Graham rule where men and women can't interact uh, with right. each other in private spaces. And uh, one of the presidents of a nonprofit raised his hand. He was like, this is interesting that the church is still having this conversation because if you would tell your congregants that are in the marketplace to abide by that rule, they would get fired for <laughs> not <Right>. being <laughs> inclusive in, in yeah. interacting. So it just, Shows the disconnect between some of how uh, some leaders yep. do ministry. I mean, how they do interaction with the opposite sex, and how that can't even function in the regular world. So it's like they're disconnected um, from the their the people that they're they're serving. Absolutely. Have you seen those kinds of disconnections? Yes. I mean, the one even as you were talking, I was thinking not only does that not work in the marketplace, but that doesn't work generationally either. 
So we had Grant Skelton, who has spoken at a lot of movement days, um, a guy in his 20s and just really, you know, unashamed about some of the things, the challenges that they're facing. And he talked a lot about that disconnect, that while we are trying to uphold, um, in some cases, rules that are fast, hard and fast for the church, they don't apply to the world. And when younger people see that disconnect between what happens in the world and what happens in the church, and it doesn't make them better because it could be argued that certain disconnects are supposed to be there, we're supposed to be set apart. Um, but when they see, you know, things like that, it, it makes it very hard for them to connect. And Grant talked about the disconnect between those who feel called to go out and evangelize and those who feel called to kind of maintain the system and how there might be an unintended generational divide there as well. That older people are trying to build and keep the institutions and younger people are trying to go out in the world. And if we don't reconcile the two and create space for those gifts to grow and flourish, we might continue this kind of slow leak of a younger generation. Mm -hmm. I think that's that's incredible and and so true. Um, what would you what else would you want to share about church collaboration that you think is important that you've seen from your experience? Mm. Well, I think one of the things that I've seen from my experience is um, the fact that God has already set in a pastor's life some built-in collaborations. So it, when I come about this work, I don't have to start from scratch. I don't have to say, hey, here's a church partner or, hey, why don't you come together and do something? Generally, there are already people in churches within their midst that they can collaborate with. And for whatever reason, they just haven't taken that next step of collaboration. Um, so I, I would encourage churches to, 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 to do what God says to Moses, you know, look at what's in your hand. And what's in your hand are relationships that are already built. You already have a pastor across the street. You already have a friend from seminary. You already have a person within your network. Um, and so I think that there are some built-ins that pastors can build on. And then I think for the, for the pastor who is trying to build some unique relationships, not just for themselves, but for their church, there are people that are longing to be stretched in their network. So with this uh, racial dialogue that we're doing with American Bible Society in Charlotte, I have seen some of the most unique and amazing partnerships that I would have never put together on my own. We have an AME Zion church that is partnering with a Lutheran church. We have um, uh, probably, they used to be Presbyterian and now I think they're non-denominational more on the conservative side, partnering with an AME church. We have a Presbyterian USA church partnering with an American Baptist church. And these partnerships are not forced, they're natural. And they happen because the pastor says, hey, why don't we go out to lunch sometime? And before you know it, you've got a cross-cultural relationship or you've got a cross-denominational relationship that can be used to strengthen you and to strengthen your congregation. So while it does take work, I believe that God has already placed those collaborative spaces right there in our lives. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I love that. I am a proponent of cross-denominational relationships. Um, one of the things that we stretch, stress here is building relationships with people outside of your denomination. So we'll have uh, one week a SEC pastor, the next week a yeah. AMC pastor, somebody yeah. that's more progressive in their theological understanding and then somebody that's not conservative. Because I think those things matter and we sharpen each other when we have those courageous conversations with each other. We might not lay in the same way, but I, I believe that there are some issues that are, are not essential. I, I yeah. know there are some things we have to hold on to as essentials, but there are some non-essential issues that we divide over that we shouldn't. Um, yeah. And it's so important that we we uh, we we talk to, to build rapport. Um, how did this church collaboration? Why? Is, how has it developed as a passion for you? Mm, for me? Well, I'm a preacher's kid. My dad's a pastor, and uh, he cares you know, night. <laughs> hey! I tell my dad, I'm like the fact that I'm saved and that I love Jesus and that I work for the church and in the church <laughs> is a testimony to him. So um, I think church collaboration is a passion for me because of what you've said. I have benefited so much from the church, but I've also seen the richness of church collaboration. My life is better because of the various collaborations of churches. 
Um, I served in an AME church while I was in seminary and, you know, attended a 4 a.m. Lent service and grew so much from that. And from the repetition of, you know, the Ten Commandments and, and the, the Decalogue in the church. Um, I grew up Baptist and, and understand the joy of baptism by immersion and the autonomy of the local church. I went to a PCUSA seminary and grew to love liturgy. And, you know, from my Episcopal friends, I'm learning to embrace God's grace. So when I see how my own life has been benefited by these cross-denominational and really cross-racial um, conversations, I can't help but encourage other people to do that. So when I see a Korean American church that would love to partner with another church, I know they're bringing a passion for prayer to the table. I know they're bringing some of the largest churches in the world um, together in the conversation, and I know that we'll be blessed. So maybe it's just my own uh, experience, but also I've seen what can happen. I mean, Movement Day is just one example. I'm looking at the affordable housing area in Charlotte, and I'm seeing churches come together and put millions of dollars up to build housing for those who need it. I've seen, you know, some of the most philanthropic organizations have come from the gathering of churches. I mean, let us not go back to the civil rights where churches came together and really made things happen for good. So, I mean, the world is the limit. The sky is the limit. And I think John 17 tells us we do this so that we can be a witness, so that God can be glorified, so that we can embody what it means that we are one body manifested in different ways. And at the end of the day, that's all we want. You know, we just want to glorify God. Mm -hmm. And I love uh, that you uh, said that because it's important as we deal with people who have left the church and saying the church is involved in the community that we show them a different story. Yeah. Maybe the church you were involved in wasn't doing anything, but that's not the case for every church. There are churches, just like you said, doing work, putting up money for affordable housing that pushes back on narratives from like Umar Johnson, who says the church is taking money from the community and not putting money back into it. Um, and so many of the conscious community have put this false narrative out, uh, but you're, you're painting a different picture for them. Um, wh what would be some more examples you've seen across the country if you were to talk to somebody in the conscious community or Dr. Umar Johnson who perpetuates this narrative, say, hey, we are in the community. We weren't just in the community. We had Dr. Marvin McNichol on to talk about the contributions of the black church throughout history. And then people were saying, well, that's not, people aren't doing that today. They were doing that back then. Uh, but you're just sharing some stories that are, to, that are not present. Um, now, if you could highlight more, I think it would be really helpful. Mm -hmm. Man, there are so many. Um, I, you know, the ones that come to my mind immediately are part of the Adopt a School um, network. You know, Adopt a School started with churches adopting schools because they recognized needs in the community. Um, I'm thinking about even my dad's church who adopted a park. Like, you know, they go to this park and they share the gospel with people and provide needs. I'm thinking about urban ministries in Charlotte that came out of the life of the church that consistently provides for the homeless, everything from an address, because you can't apply for jobs without having an address, to showers, to clothing, to conversations with um, shelters. Man, I, I mean, I'm thinking about um, Dress for Success that, that comes out of churches wanting to do more, and those are just on the side of charity. Um, there are, there are, my mind is like flooded with examples. There's so many examples of churches that say we will come together to make justice happen in our community. Um, you know, again, through American Bible Society, I have the unique privilege of convening churches in one way. And one of the ways that we did that was we did um, a community Bible experience. It's an eight week reading of the New Testament. And you think on the surface, it's the Bible. It's not going to go, you know, beyond the church. So we were able to work through an association to bring 15 churches together to read through the Bible every day of the week. They were doing the same passages. And we happened to have a woman who had just got back into the Bible. She went to her church and for whatever reason, she missed Bible study. And she was able to find other churches within a five mile radius doing the same Bible study. So she just showed up in another church, was able to pick up right where she left off engage with people. And she said to me, I have never in my life seen the church um, in the same radius on the same page on a Wednesday night. 
And she went out and told other people, this is how God is bringing the church together on one page. I mean, and it's these, these seem like small examples, but to your point, it's reshaping a narrative that the church is not in isolation. And yes, every church isn't perfect. In fact, no church is perfect. But when we put the narratives together, we see that churches are coming together to build buildings. In Charlotte, there's a, a group of churches, one Presbyterian, one Baptist, one United Methodist, that came together to build a seniors um, community center. So the community center is being built and these three churches came together because they're all in the same neighborhood and said, let's, let's not try and figure it out on our own. Let's put our resources together to make this happen to benefit the community. And it's just, I mean, the list goes on and on. So part of the challenge is how do we reclaim the narrative? How do we demonstrate that the church has always been about collaboration and about community and that that, that, that narrative has been co-opted by secular organizations? Um, but when reality, this work began with people who said, I love God so much and I love God's people so much that I want to make a difference. Mm -hmm. I mean, I really think it is a church message. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. awesome. That is so awesome. Thank you so much, Nicole, for being with us. What Thank resources would you recommend uh, uh, concerning the Movement Day website, um, resources for church collaboration, uh, websites for what you're doing with the American Bible Society, um, and how can people get in contact with you personally and your, your personal ministry? Yes. So uh, for websites, you can go to uh, movementday.org, movementdaycharlotte.com. Uh, for the work that I'm doing with American Bible Society, although it spans in different cities, you can start by going to charlotte.bible. You'll be able to find out more about some of the programs I was talking about, as well as contact information for me under the Contact Us or About Us page. Um, for American Bible Society, you can go to americanbible.org. And for my own ministry, and perhaps to order my book, you can go to sfiministries.org for Soul Fire International Ministries. I've given you like a hundred websites. <laughs> uh, awesome. And, and before we go, tell, tell our, our listeners a little bit about what your book is about. Yeah. So my book is called Made to Lead, Empowering Women for Ministry. Um, it came out of my own search to know how to do ministry. So many resources are out there to say uh, whether or not women should lead in various areas of ministry, um, but very few actually tell us how. And since I've published, the field of the how-to spaces for women in ministry is enormous and growing, and yet there's still a void. So this is just one seed, one way to help women who may be trying to, uh, to discern whether or not God is calling them to le leadership, women who may be in context that don't affirm their leadership, but they still want to know how to work within that context, uh, men who are trying to figure out how to nurture and support the women they serve, this book is written for them. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Nicole. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you, Lisa. I hope you have a wonderful and blessed day. Thank <laughs> you.